But when this comes to an end, just following orders is not going to be a good legal defense. Just from, following orders from the new government is not going create? to be your saving grace while you're standing on the other side of that that witness box. <laughs> I'm speaking to each and every. I mean, that's Pat King choosing his words carefully, as you can tell. He's normally he just like he he kind of just goes off cuff. He doesn't he doesn't really prepare. This kind of behavior then endorses less procreation. All right, so the less procreation, the less white people or you know Anglo-Saxon. Let's say. Oops, oops. Uh oh, said the quiet part out loud. Ah, oh, well, probably not. We're going to start with the trucker rally. We're going to talk about it today. I'm going to be giving you a background to the founders of the trucker rally. We're going to be talking a little bit about the new Emergency Measures Act that is being invoked in Canada. Uh, right now, they're actually debating about it in Parliament. I'm sure it's spicy. Uh, maybe it's spicy in French. I don't know. Va-t-on, pièce de merde, toi, je vais sucer ta mère, and all this kind of stuff. Maybe that's what's going on right now. Um, but uh, in, in the interim, I, I'm just going to give a quick update to, to what exactly is happening on the ground. Story, and that would be a check on the protests across the country. Ottawa, our nation's capital, being a big one. It's closing in on a third full week. Something that's different now, today, police are handing out pieces of paper telling protesters paper. it is time to leave now. We've got CBC's David Thurton right there on the scene in Ottawa. What Combined with some of them, you know, saying things. Do along not come. That, yeah. Do not come. What's happening, David? Hey, Suana, yeah, something's different today. They're handing out those pieces of paper, but if you look at the scene behind me, not much has really changed. Take mm. a look at it. You can see the trucks, the people, the tents, the vehicles are rammed in here on the street in front of Parliament Did somebody Hill. say but ram? like you said, stuff has changed today. The Ottawa police have been handing out these pieces of paper that have been alerting protesters that they have broken the law, that they could be charged with a criminal offence, they could receive bail, they could not receive bi bail, it all depends, and that they should leave immediately. They started handing out these notices a day after Ottawa's police chief, uh, as Peter Slowly, announced that he was stepping down, resigning. So this sounds like it's a change of tactic for the police. We have been seeing more police on the scene. My <laughs> colleagues have been... We tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. Did you try paper? Oh, oh, strongly worded uh, letters, you say. Oh, yeah, let's bring them some parchment. We'll see what they say. Out earlier today, I've been saying that they've seen them, you know, handing out uh, these notices and also tickets to protesters. But so far, when you look at the big scale, the grand scale of things, it doesn't appear that much has changed. The protesters have dug in. As you talk to them, what are they saying? To be David? fair, they dug in quite a while ago. Yeah, so when we've been out, we've been out earlier today talking to protesters and, you know, uh, one of my colleagues did see uh, a protester or some protesters leave, but for the most part, uh, a lot have said that they aren't leaving, that they aren't going anywhere, anywhere. So have a listen. No concerns. I will give up my life for this. Whatever it takes. No, it will not make me leave. No, I'm a Canadian citizen. I have a right or a freedom to bring a fringe upon. This has to stop. And the mandates have to stop. This is morphed into a greater uh, issue than just specific. Uh I don't know if this story has been confirmed or if it's true. If you haven't heard it, it's heartbreaking. Uh, so this nine-year-old daughter is receiving palliative care in Winnipeg, and he needs to be vaccinated to see her, but he won't get vaccinated and is instead at the protest. Klassen has two campers in his black semi-trailer at the Emerson blockade that could potentially be seized. Klassen described Trudeau's move to invoke emergency powers as a scare tactic so they can take away everything from us, he said. Klassen said he hasn't been able to visit his nine-year-old daughter in months. She's receiving palliative care at St. Amant, a care residence in Winnipeg, but due to restrictions that require visitors to be fully vaccinated, Klassen and his wife can't see her. This is something worth fighting for. It's just grim. The border, truckers being allowed to cross the border. All the mandates in the country must stop immediately. I've got, gotten through the phases of, of preparing myself mentally, so uh, I'm ready and willing to do what it takes. What does that mean? 
So certainly those protesters say that they aren't going anywhere, but it doesn't appear the police are going anywhere either. Like I said, we've been seeing more officers on the scene. We'll see what comes of that in the next coming hours as the situation unfolds, Suana. We'll talk again. Thanks for the update, David. CBC's David Thurton in Ottawa. So right now they're arguing in the parliament about everything. Oh, I told you it'd be in French. Based on the Canadians, as of of This plan will welcome more newcomers in the in the three in the coming year and will continue to help key sectors of our economy. It'll help staff almost a million unfilled positions across all sectors. We'll also help filling in for the five million Canadians set to retire by 2030. Here, here. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many Canadians are raising serious concerns that the Emergency Act should not apply to legal protests. We know that there have been many counter-protesters who are standing up to the convoy, and we've seen some of those counter-protesters arrested by police instead of the actual convoy. So Canadians raise a question, what assurances will the Prime Minister provide so that legal protests are not impacted by the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Here. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. It's an excellent question and one we are also very much preoccupied with, which is why uh, in uh, the measures set forward, we've been very clear uh, to indicate that uh, illegal protests, illegal barricades, illegal blockages are the ones that we are giving extra tools for the police to respond to. Of course, we will always stand up for Canadians' charter rights. We will always stand up for freedom of peaceful of assembly, of freedom of, of expression. That is extremely important. But we we also know that it is the police of jurisdiction who need to do their jobs and not Canadians. So Jigmeet uh, raises a very good point, and it's one that you've probably been wondering for a while. What exactly is going the fuck on, okay? Especially if you're not in Canada. You're probably like, what, what is going on? Why are the Winnipeg police not doing anything? How much money goes towards the Winnipeg police? I found that out. Turns out it's 26.8% of their entire budget goes towards the police. The police that actually have effectively been doing nothing in Winnipeg, on top of which the first person they arrested happened to be an indigenous protester who was counter-protesting with a sign that says you're on stolen land, and then they arrested that person saying that uh, they were apparently uh, intoxicated it turned out that they're not intoxicated, but don't worry, they weren't charged, they were then released. But it seems kind of strange, isn't it? Like, there's all these police, they get all this money from the city, and yet they're not defending the people of their cities, and they're not upholding the safety of the city, and instead they seem to be cozying up quite a bit to these truckers. There's, uh, of course, the footage of them giving them coffee and donuts, there's the footage of the thumbs up, there's all the video releases of them saying, like, oh, we stand with you, oh yeah, we're totally 100% on your side, those kind of things. Now, that doesn't speak for all police, of course, that's me uh, trying to uh, uh, sully the well, let's just say that. Um, there's also, of course, the ones who've been giving them rides and the cars, uh, helping them move their tents, all that kind of shit. Uh, even if you don't think that the police uh, overwhelmingly or just overall are in support of what the truckers are doing, you can definitely say uh, without, uh, you know, uh, trespassing on any kind of strange territory here, uh, that they have allowed it to go on and they've kind of tolerated it. Now, there's a handful of reasons. Uh, one, the truckers, specifically in Ottawa, are using uh, a very dangerous tactic of involving their children. Uh, they've got, some of them have their ch kids inside the trucks uh, or the vans or whatever vehicles they've had. And of course, that complicates this use thir uh, further. No one wants uh, to have a Waco on their hands. So obviously, when there's children involved, the whole thing becomes infinitely more complicated. And then, of course, there is the lie that has been pushed by the Conservatives right now that this is a 100% peaceful protest. As I'm sure you've uh, ascertained from watching my footage and coverage over the last couple weeks, uh, it is not peaceful. Clean up your room. Um, now, quite 185. Thanks for giving this up to this guy, Common Fallon. Uh, Fallen. Oh, sorry. Um, but I, I, I want to say this very quickly. Um, if, if it happens to do with, uh, you know, the, the, the concept that uh, these truckers are 100% peaceful, uh, there's the argument to be made that, uh, you know, 
trucks uh, blaring their horns all day, uh, day in, day out inside of a busy city center, uh, that, that isn't exactly going to be great for the people who live there. Uh, the harassment that has been taking place on the streets, numerous people have both uh, reported and been filmed being harassed for wearing masks, uh, being told to take their masks off. There has been hate crimes, people with uh, pride flags having their buildings smashed in, stuff of that nature. There's, of course, been the uh, plethora of hate symbols that have been there. So there's been a lot of things that have been worrying uh, to say the very least, and that accelerates all the way to the person uh, who was filmed trying to set up fireworks in a building while taping the doors to the building or people putting handcuffs uh, and testing how strong uh, buildings would be for the release. And again, those aren't the sum total of truckers. Uh, if, you, if you said that this was the entire trucker occupation or rally or whatever you want to call it, then that also would be disingenuous. But... The police have been completely uh, completely ineffective at their jobs, and a lot of people have been kind of wondering as to why. So, thanks to the help of art, I have figured it out. I've cracked the case. Behold, art. Yes, that's right. It's all we needed. I wanted to get a nice big picture of uh, who's really in charge here. So now we all know it happens to be the Queen. Yes, that's who gives uh, Trudeau his marching orders. Yes, he's just, uh, he's a grandma's boy at the end of the day, just doing whatever the Queen says. So, there has been other occupations that have taken place and are continuing to take place inside of Canada. Notably, I'm going to point out a handful of them. Uh... These ones are in the. Uh, these ones have pro-capital interests, and they have uh, had a lot of police action. So there's the Ferry Creek, the old growth forest protests that are taking place in northern BC. Over 800 people have been arrested so far in that protest. Now it hasn't been defeated, uh, but at the same time, the interests of the logging industry have thoroughly been uh, enforced. Uh, by the police trying to shut the people down who are trying to block uh, the deforestation of old growth forests. And you can see, and I showed you the footage earlier, of the brutality that has been done in which they will actually take people's masks off and pepper spray them, tackle them to the ground. All that was happening without the Emergency Measures Act uh, in place or any necess uh, necessity for that. There's uh, the Watsutan people and their sovereign land occupation by the RCMP. That is for the interest of the Coastal Gaslink Pipeline, of which the RCMP also have their union has investments in uh, for the retirement fund. Funds. So they've not only got uh, the interests of capital in the form of the coastal gas and uh, pipeline, they've also got the interests of the RCMP in, in their investment, which I don't think should be permitted or allowed. That's something that should be called out, by the way. Uh, I don't think you should be able to do that. But here we are. Also, the Toronto homeless camp brutality that I showed you yesterday, in which people were actually being thrown to the ground, a woman was ripped right out of her wheelchair, they were being pepper sprayed, all that kind of stuff, uh, has a lot to do with the fact that people were uh, obviously looking for uh, their real estate value to not be hamp uh, harpened, or sorry, I, I guess... Uh, dampened, let's say that, by the presence of a large homeless uh, encampment taking place there. But what has the trucker occupation been asking for? Because that's been a question that a lot of people haven't been able to answer, which is weird because they've been very clear from the very start. They have but one demand, an end to all COVID restrictions and mandates. Now, unlike worker strikes, all right, which are to get more power for the workers. So if you have a strike, it's uh, basically you have your employer, uh, you and the rest of the employees, you band together, you do a strike, you make a list of demands, you form a union, they have to recognize the union. If they don't recognize the union, you continue to strike in order to be able to be recognized. Once you get the union, you then have bargaining power, and then they have to bargain with the union in order to make changes that can impact your lives, such as whether or not uh, you will have, uh, you know, advanced health care, work overtime hours, uh, you know, being able to prevent wage theft, wage theft, which is a monstrously huge problem. Uh, problem. None of that has been talked about by the uh, trucker uh, spokesman or, or the occupiers or whatever you want to call them. Uh, all they've asked for is a complete end to all COVID restrictions in Canada. And, and that means everything. That means the masks, the social distancing, the vaccine mandates, everything, an end to any and all COVID measures, please. In the event that you're not going to do that, the second option is that, of course, Trudeau and the Liberal uh, government, the democratically elected Liberal government, resign. In disgrace, ideally. Uh, resign, right? But what are the reasons why the uh, police haven't been uh, necessarily doing what they're supposed to be doing, aka their jobs, is that the truckers themselves and what they represent do not directly threaten systems of power in this country. They didn't for a while. 
I'm going to get to that, by the way. There, there is a change that happens. Before, they were effectively blocking off a whole bunch of borders, right? The first one they blocked off was the Alberta crossing border. And that's when Jason Kenney had a lot of trouble dealing with this because he was like, eh, but uh, I have also said in the past that I hate people blocking borders, but I, I'm, I'm kind of on your side, but I'm not. Uh, and that's what every conservative in, in this country has been trying to do, right? Um, when there's been prior pro, uh, like uh, protests in Canada, uh, many different movements, uh, the, suffra uh, the suffragette movement, for example, uh, the right for women to vote in this country, uh, civil rights movements in this country as well, indigenous rights movements in this country as well. Those are movements that, uh, for the large part, definitely try to disrupt the current system of power, the hierarchy of power that you have in this country, and they are met with force. Uh, for good reason, or they are met with force if they are directly in conflict with capital interests, as are these ones I'm showing you before you, some of whom are still taking place right now as I'm speaking. That was not the case with the truckers in their initial status, and that's one of the reasons why you might see a lot of overlap with a lot of police officers uh, being so brazen as to make videos saying, uh, we support you, we support the truckers, uh, I'm for freedom, uh, I'm for all of that. This was the other reason why you had a large amount of capital interest coming in uh, from outside sources, namely the US of A. A whole bunch of people, it turned out, who were investing in the truckers, the ones who were, like, the, the trucker funding got hacked. And once the hack revealed where all the money was coming from, the majority of it coming from the U.S., a lot of the people who were donating very large sums of money are, in fact, wealthy business owners, people who have employees, many employees. Again, the capitalist class. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm just trying to give you a little, uh, you know, Marxist analysis, a little a little di a dialectical material analysis of this entire thing. So you can see the contrast and conflict that is happening between people who want to stop. That is combined with ideology. Yes, there are people who just genuinely in their heart of heart believe that there should not be vaccine mandates. There should not be any encroachment on this kind of stuff. Now, that ideology also mixes in with American capitalism, where a lot of people in America just didn't want to do fuck all. When it came to COVID, because that was going to hurt the bottom line. That was going to hurt the line going up. That was going to hurt. So that's why you have a lot of conservative states, namely people like Ron DeSantis, who are just like, fuck it. J just, just go. Go out there and frolic. Who, who cares what happens, right? The, the line must go up. And it's funny, because while that is happening, you still have a lot of neoliberal think tanks who are saying at the same time, if you do not take the right steps and precautions, this will, in the long term, hurt business more. It, it's going to be... Uh, a damaging effect upon the economy if you have lots and lots of Americans who are sick, especially Americans who don't have health care, all this kind of stuff. I don't want to get too derailed with it, but that's a large part in why you were seeing either what you consider to be a collusion, there was no collusion between the, co the cops and the protesters, outside of those couple military people, but also a lot of ex-cops, ex-military, ex-RCMP, uh, the head of security is an ex-RCMP officer, all involving themselves with the convoy, and what seems to be, and I'm sure a lot of people are confused, a little chummy-chummy, like the, the little locked-in risks, okay? Um, and, and that basically is to explain all that part. Then, their, ta their tactics uh, advanced. And the protesters began blocking the U.S.-Canada border crossings, especially one of the main ones in Coots. And that directly started impacting capital in Canada. This is the part. This is why reducing this entire thing to sound bites and or do you stand for this or do you stand for that? Lance, you said you stand for workers, but you don't stand for the truckers. Are the truckers not workers? Lance, you say you stand for this, but you're not said. You're saying that this has the interest of capital behind it, yet they're shutting down the Canadian economy. So it's complicated. It's more complicated than a single line that I write out will say. But when this tactic changes, the protesters begin blocking the US-Canada border, yes, things begin to accelerate. Now, Justin Trudeau, uh, in his infinite wisdom, and I should be saying uh, in, in service of His Majesty the Queen, um, obviously uh, has been handling this uh, pretty deplorably in that he has really done nothing more than simply make press conferences every now and then, stating emphatically that the truckers uh, are, uh, you know, uh, uh, making unreasonable demands uh, in the sense that, like, every single one of them happens to be, uh, you know, either the far right, uh, they happen to be, like, he's not tapping into the fact that a lot of people in this country, uh, a very large portion, are, are deeply upset with Justin Trudeau for a handful of reasons. Not for the leftist reasons. If you want to be upset at Justin Trudeau from a leftist perspective, there's a lot of different things you can come at this guy for. A ton of broken promises that were made during his campaigns, the fact that the NDP are basically the ones responsible for CERB, the fact that under the pandemic, the NDP proposed a motion that was not radical, by the way. All they asked for is that we put a 1% tax 
on the most wealthy Canadians, the sum total of if you have more than 10, or no, sorry, they set it at 20 million. If you have more than 20 million in assets, we will now tax your existing assets at 1% using that revenue to pay for all of the poorest and, and middle income Canadians, uh, all the services they may need to get through COVID. Uh, and also, they also wanted to propose things like, should we have pharmacare? Uh, should we have, uh, you know, eye care? Stuff like this. Everything they have tabled and brought forth, the Liberals have shut down effectively. So that's reasons to be bad at Justin Trudeau, uh, if, if you're coming at this from a leftist perspective. So when the protests begin blocking the US-Canada border crossing, things started to accelerate. There has been absolutely no calls for Mr. Justin Trudeau uh, uh, to speak out against uh, what is to be a complete failure of the actual police systems in these various provinces. If you turn to Twitter, of course, you'll see people just beside themselves in Ottawa uh, wondering why the police uh, continue to not really do anything about this. And of course, that is a very complicated statement in and of itself. But once the Canadian economy becomes impacted, that's when the federal government steps in. One very crucial thing to remember, the way that COVID rules are set in this country is not set by the federal government. There is nothing Justin can do uh, as, as, you know, the Prime Minister of Canada to change what the premiers of the provinces have done outside of advising them, holding meetings with them, begging them if he wants to. But outside of that, the demands of the truckers on their surface do not make sense. They just don't understand how the system works. It makes this whole thing very difficult because if you have people protesting and all they have is these nebulous terms like freedom. We want freedom. We want an end to everything. And that happens to be decisions made by the provinces, not by the prime minister. How do you even try to negotiate with them? How do you meet their demands? One, a democratically elected government is not just going to completely step down because of a trucker protest. Two, if they want an end to all mandates, they're going to have to protest individually uh, for a time period or whatever it takes in each individual province to remove those. Three, they're never going to be able to change the American rules ever. There, 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 like there's no situation in which America, uh, I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Americans, is America about to bow down to the protesters on the other end and be like, well, you know, uh, they, they've made some demands. They're asking for freedom. We like freedom. So, you know, uh, Joe Biden's probably just going to remove the vaccine mandates that go in the opposite direction for truckers that return into Canada who will then have to have vaccination. So, no, uh, it's pretty much the definition of unreasonable demands at any either rate. Once uh, the Canadian economy was so deeply impacted, then yes, once again, the interests of capital are going to come into this. And Justin Trudeau is invoking the Emergency Measures Act. I'm going to talk about the Emergency Measures Act in a second. I want you to put a pin in that for now uh, because I want to explain one last very important thing. If you have a worldview and your worldview is that globalists or an elite cabal of individuals are the people who control everything that happens in this uh, planet, and they happen to have meetings, secret meetings, whether it be the Illuminati, uh, whether it be the Bilderbergs, uh, the Soros, uh, you know, it's usually a Jewish family, insert whatever conspiracy theory you want. If that is your world belief, and they meet once a year in the Davos uh, group, or they, they do this and they plan the Great Reset, or whatever your idea is that the richest people in the world all meet together and that they decide what exactly happens to us, the ants, right? That, that's basically your worldview. Um, it doesn't have a complete understanding of how capitalism works. And I'll explain this very simply. If you want to see the richest human beings in the world, it's not a secret. We can all do that right now. I can I can show you who the people who control the planet are. Go look it up right now. You'll see the top 10 or the top 100 richest human beings. And a lot of familiar faces will be in the top 10. Your Bezos, your Elon Musk, your Mark Zuckerberg, uh, your Jack Dorsey, what have you. A lot of tech bros happen to be in the top 10 richest human beings of all time. Funny that. Um... And you'll you'll probably see something that uh, uh, may shock you, that all of them do not have a secret meeting, uh, all, all the top 10 richest people once a year to decide what us, the ants, are going to do and, and what kind of like soylent they'll be feeding us. Capitalism uh, has what I may consider a flaw inherent to it, and that is competition. And part of that means that you can have competing capital interests at any time driving forces. In this case, you can have capital interests of people in America who happen to be uh, people who own businesses, who may be very invested in seeing what happens in Canada create a domino effect in America. So ideally, if we can do this in Canada, maybe they'll lower all the restrictions in that country, and then we can have all the restrictions lowered here. I don't have to worry about the uh, you know the safety of my workers as much, and I can continue doing business as I did before. I had any kind of a mandate imposed upon me, stuff of that nature. That can combine 
with the capital interests of a whole bunch of manufacturing plants in Canada right now, auto manufacturers who do have a very large capital interest in not having their entire production shut down, who are now uh, very, very interested in having Justin Trudeau return things to normal. So, uh, multiple things can be true at once. It doesn't just mean because there is a far-right element in the trucker convoy or there is a capitalist drive uh, towards, uh, you know, fueling uh, these protests and, and their interests, that there can also be one uh, once uh, they effectively try to shut down one of the largest borders, if not the largest border crossing in this country. Uh, Just Belmont, too. Thank you for giving the tier one sub to Lost. S, good to see you, Lost. Everyone go to switch.tv slash Lost. S-I-O-U-X. Very good to see you. Welcome in. So, uh, basically, that's a, a quick description of everything there. Um, the Emergency Act, we'll get into in one second. I want to talk about this. If you didn't hear yesterday, uh, and I showed you that the uh, head of security for the trucker crossing team, he came out and tried to get ahead of the story. Uh, being that, like, uh, we have received reports that uh, something has happened. It's not directly related to the truckers or the trucker rally, or uh, let's not look up who James McKenzie is. Uh, ideally, he uh, has nothing to do with this. But anyways, four Alberta border crossing protesters charged with conspiring to murder RCMP officers. Seven of the protesters arrested in connection with the blockade at Coots, uh, Alberta border crossing, have been granted bail, but those accused of conspiring to murder RCMP officers remain behind bars. The first 11 protesters to be arrested ahead of the two others who were taken into custody later on Monday made their first court appearance on Tuesday afternoon on charges that include conspiracy to murder, mischief, and possession of a weapon. The on and off blockade on the normally busy border crossing uh, that people opposed to COVID-19 health restrictions has lasted more than two weeks. The arrest followed an RCMP raid of the trailers early morning hours on Monday when officers seized guns, body armor, a large quantity of ammunition, high-capacity firearm magazines. What uh, this isn't talking about is the uh, insignias that were put on... Or did they talk about it? Ugh. Fucking liberal media in this country has no idea how the alt-right or the far-right operates. It's very embarrassing. Anyways, uh, there were signs for uh, Diagolon, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, the far-right organizations here. Uh, insignias on their uh, things as well as the Played Army, uh, which, uh, which shows some connection to James McKenzie, something I've spoken about before. Um, but again, similar to how you have far-right militias in America, they exist in Canada. Typically, we do not see them with quite this arsenal of firearms uh, because there's much heavier gun restrictions in Canada to be able to amass things of this nature uh, or or I mean I know that the story is that uh, officially a handful of the, the firearms were also stolen uh, from uh, somewhere near but uh, either way something that is terrifying is that these far right uh, groups uh, are uh, incentivized as well as um, trained uh, to try and take uh, drastic action if necessary now, this is the lawyer for the truckers speaking about how now more than ever uh, action is needed. All right, Canada, we're here with Keith. This is our legal representation out here. He's got a little bit of info for you for the, the letters that have been being left on everybody's doorsteps hey, by Ottawa City Lawrence Police today. Southern. This is important information. Everybody needs to get this out. Keith? Hi there. I'm uh, legal counsel to the not-for-profit Freedom Convoy. Uh, the federal government released a new prop proclamation last night under the Emergencies Act and the legal wording of it is clear. It doesn't say what the police are telling you it says. It clearly the legal proclamation that was issued by the federal government continues to allow for peaceful protests. It allows for peaceful assembly. It allows for Canadians who are concerned about their charter rights and who want to bring their children to participate in the restoration of their future rights to come to Ottawa. The order says that you can only not come to Ottawa if you're going to disrupt international trade, disrupt um, critical... Please do not bring your children to events that could have violence or involve police officers. It is just dangerous. Do not do that. ...infrastructure or engage in acts of violence. No one involved in this freedom movement, none of the truckers, support any of those things. So if you're thinking about doing those things, don't come and give your head a shake. Yep. We're about peaceful protest. This emergency order from the federal government does not restrict Canadians' rights of peaceful assembly. However, what we can see on the ground here is the police look to be gearing up. It looks like the federal government is going to tell the police to go and use violence against lawful protesters. And one way to stop that from happening is Canada Canadians is who are concerned as... about their rights and government overreach to come to Ottawa as soon as you can get here and stand with the truckers. 
We believe the police are reluctant to follow this. If they follow what the federal government's telling the police to do, it's it will be an illegal order. It will be unlawful. So, not, not the illegal part, but the fact that the police are reluctant to enforce it. If you come and stand with the protesters, it will make it harder for the police to act on what they're being told to do. So, like, this isn't direct defiance of what both the public of Canada and what everyone is asking for right now. Just basically saying, hey, we need you now more than ever. Uh, you know, this is this is the time. Uh, start showing up. Uh, we need boots on the ground. More people, please arrive. Um so I, I did a, a collaboration with It Could Happen Here uh, to show you a little quick history primer on who exactly are the founders of the trucker rally. Where is all of this coming from? Who are the originators? Did this start uh, just a couple of weeks ago or did this start years ago? It's, it's years ago. That's the answer. But anyways, this is me uh, crossing powers with uh, the It Could Happen Here podcast. Please go subscribe to the It Could Happen Here podcast. Uh, Robert Evans does a lot of great work. Uh, you may also find him doing shows with Cody Shoddy. Uh They have the Worst Year Ever podcast, which is also quite entertaining. Well with your time. Or Behind the Bastards, uh, which gives you a little bit of history uh, to a number of different bastards throughout society. Uh, hopefully that's not a word that's going to get me banned like the C word did yesterday, but uh, but we'll see. An escape from the more divisive, violent, and fascist elements of U.S. politics and culture. But just like climate change, <laughs> capitalism, or any other enveloping force, fascism and the slide towards it can never be truly escaped, right? There is no other, there is no a way, and it's especially hard to see it when it's growing on the back of your own head. They're corporate communists are stealing money. It, I mean, this is literally theft by deception. Primarily through Islamophobia, Far-right ethno-nationalist tendencies have been bubbling under the surface of Canada for a long while. And since Trudeau has taken office in 2015, there has been a perfect politically allowed boogeyman to blame every problem onto. That can include everything from Trudeau is taking away our oil and gas jobs, or Trudeau is bringing in Muslim terrorists to Canada, or Trudeau is starving your children through health mandates. Canadian right-wing protest has been steadily growing the past five years. There's been multiple flare-ups of far-right rhetoric with the Canadian Yellow Vests, the Western Separatist uh, Wexit gotta, or gotta Western Exit right Movement, now. and the pseudo-fascist People's Party of Canada. Incorporation of pandemic conspiracies and anti-vaccine sentiments into the already disaffected rural Canadian right-wingers starting in 2020 and continuing to the present has accelerated not only the conspiratorial far-right rhetoric among conservative voters, but also what is seen as valid political action in those people's eyes. But before we get into how the convoy started, with anger concerning COVID-19 health mandates and misinformation concerning empty store shelves, we have to first go back in time to even before the COVID-19 virus was a blip on anyone's radar. No, this is not a YouTube video you can watch yet. I will be releasing it. This is you're seeing a, a world premiere. I, I was I was working on this last night. Like basically, I I took Chico for a walk yesterday. Right afterwards, I was like, well, I was walking him. I put on you know the my podcast, and I was like, oh, there's there's a new it could happen here. They're talking about the trucker convoy, and I was listening to it. I was like, whoa, this is a really good history lesson for anyone who doesn't know the origins. And then I reached out and I said, can I turn it into a YouTube video? And they were like, yay. Uh, so then I I stayed up really late trying to turn it into a YouTube video. So um, it just enjoy it for now. I'll, I'll release it eventually on, on youtube.com slash the surf TV. In February 2019, the Canadian Yellow Vests organized something called the United We Roll Convoy. The result was around 170 trucks driving cross country through the more liberal east to Ottawa. The goal was to represent the concerns of disenfranchised oil and gas workers in the western provinces and their opposition to proposed environmental and new energy policies. Yellow Vests Canada was largely founded by individuals already associated with Canada's far right. Not to be confused with the Yellow Vest movement in France. They co-opted it. And not a lot of people know about this little blip in history, especially if you're not in Canada, because it was relatively small. But the same people who organized this, a lot of the key people, uh, used this kind of as a testing ground and then combined it with all the anti-mandates, uh, anti-vax, anti-mask crowd who become very, very angry and galvanized, not only in Canada, but around the world. Which at the time was primarily united through anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia. 
Inspired by the French Yellow Vest movement, they copied their aesthetics and adopted new grievances and reactionary rhetoric that would get them a much larger audience. By the time United We Roll arrived in Ottawa, the media started to catch on to the more problematic elements about their organization. Neo-Nazi Faith Goldie spoke on a stage. Many members of hate groups responded in attendance, and with numbers so low, it made their more extreme participants stick out. Instead of focusing the message on oil and gas, as they claim to represent Western alienation from a distant liberal Ottawa, some of its participants seemed more interested in protesting Ottawa's immigration policies than arguing for specific fixes for Alberta's oil patch. Plus, if you peeked inside any Canadian Yellow Vest Facebook group, you would be flooded with hundreds of examples of explicit anti-Muslim racism and calls for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's arrest and execution, a theme that remains common among COVID conspiracy demonstrations today. But at the end of it, United We Roll was widely considered a bust, with only a few hundred participants in Ottawa, and despite raising almost $150,000, the organizers failed to disclose how much of that money was actually spent on convoy expenses like gas and food. Afterwards, the Yellow Vests Canada movement started to kinda die out, though some holdouts kept smaller demonstrations going for months, particularly in the conservative oil province of Alberta. But to us now, United We Rule can be seen as a small test run for the current situation in 2022. In fact, it shares many of the same organizers and even the same promotional materials. Except this time, they have the added weight of many more people radicalized into conspiracism throughout the pandemic and much more funding. So with that in mind, let's dive into the components of the initial organizing effort. On January 14th, 2022, a GoFundMe account was set up for a so-called trucker convoy, ahead of the January 15th adoption of the mandate requiring all cross-border transportation drivers to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccine mandates in Canada have been in effect since October 30th for ship crews, railways, and airline workers. But effective January 15th, the federal government expanded the requirement to truck drivers returning from the states. And those who will remain unvaccinated will not be able to enter Canada without quarantine. One week later, a reciprocal policy went into effect in the United States for Canadian truckers crossing into their border, which means going forward, you cannot really cross the border at all while remaining unvaccinated. At this point in mid-January, a majority of Canadians still broadly supported health mandates aimed at limiting the spread of COVID. But a big part of the early propaganda push for the convoy was photos alleged to have been from current Canadian grocery stores, which they were not, with barren, empty shelves. The idea was that COVID restrictions were already severely impacting the supply line, and any additional mandates would begin to starve the population and effectively shut down international trade. Put a note in this. Lance, that lady claims she is Métis. Oh, I exposed that already. She is not. Uh, yeah, there's. if you look at Asian, and, uh, Asian Indians... Uh, Twitter account. I sent him the links of uh, like her uh, genealogy tracker, and there's no one who claims her as her kin. So yeah, she is not. She is a a fake pretend uh, Métis. And by the way, they use that. They try to weaponize that. They've like they've given press conferences where you know one of the trucking uh, convoy founders is like, "Well, I'm Jewish. She's Métis. This is a very multicultural group you have before you." Uh, a lot of people are trying to say that this has uh, like ties to the far right or uh, white nationalists. I mean, we have uh, indigenous representation over here. Uh, no, it turns out that was a complete lie. Idea, by the way, it will come up later. Ideas for another truck convoy like United We Roll have been tossed around for a while online. And with this new mandate on truckers and vaccines, a time presented itself to give the convoy idea another go. In the early truck convoy organizing, there were primarily four familiar far-right faces working together to set things up. All right, so this is the important part, okay? This is the part that if you don't already know, now you know. So now you know both the history that this actually started out years ago as something called the Unite We Roll rally, uh, which was directly uh, the Yellow Vest movement in Canada, which is a far-right movement. It's not the Yellow Vests uh, in France, which is actually quite a base movement, uh, and that there was already a, a lot of far-right figures involved at that time, as well as a lot of Islamophobia. And although they were talking and protesting about, you know, uh, a, a specific bill that uh, Trudeau was imposing that they thought was going to hurt the oil and gas industry, there there was also a lot of talks about immigration and specifically a lot of worry about uh, what happens if Muslims start coming into this country in large numbers. So 
Now, the four key founding members of the Trucker Rally 2022. None of whom are truck drivers, by the way. The originally listed organizers on the GoFundMe page were Tamara Litch and BJ Ditcher. Both have notable experience with far-right organizing. Tamara Litch was born in my home province of Saskatchewan, but now hails from the town of Medicine Hat, Alberta, where she served as an organizer for Yellow Vests Canada, a regional coordinator for the Separatist Western Exit, or Wexit, movement in Alberta, and now the secretary for the Maverick Party, another far-right extreme separatist movement and fringe political party. Litch started attending and boosting Yellow Vest events starting in 2018, and her social media posts from around the time show in one moment calling out some hateful rhetoric from within the movement, while also posting Islamophobic articles of her own and conspiracies about the Muslim Brotherhood operating in Canada. A few days after the GoFundMe was created, Benjamin B.J. Ditcher, one-time Conservative Party of Canada candidate, People's Party of Canada booster, and co-founder of a Canadian far-right podcast network, appeared as a co-organizer cool on the GoFundMe page. 2019, he claimed that Islamist entryism is rotting away our society like syphilis. Benjamin Ditcher was also one of the first people to give a speech at the first proto-fascist People's Party of Canada conference in Quebec, saying that the Conservative Party of Canada is suffering from the stench of cultural relativism and political Islam, and a whole bunch of stuff, you know, in that general vein. It is suffering from the stench of extremism, the same way third world countries suffer from extremist groups, separatist groups, communist guerrilla factions, paramilitaries, organized crime, and more. James Botter was another one of the four key organizers of the trucker convoy to Ottawa. Botter is an admitted conspiracy theorist who has endorsed QAnon and called COVID the biggest political scam in history. He's also a former activist with the Yellow Vests Canada and United We Roll. Botter's main project, however, is running the Canada Unity website, which is one of the original nexus points for organizing and spreading word about this convoy. The group contends that vaccine mandates and passports are illegal under Canada's constitution, the Nuremberg Code, and a host of other international conventions. Botter has long been a fringe figure, but his movements started picking up steam and support as announcements and continuations of restrictions aimed at curbing COVID-19 spread have continued. The last big major player is Patrick King, another former Yellow Vester, one-time major figure in the Wexit movement, as well as United We Roll. On January 18th, 2022, Pat King hosted a live stream for James Botter to promote the Canada Unity website and to announce it as the official page for the Freedom Trucker Convoy, or as they called it, Operation Bear Hug. King is a conspiracy theorist and popular streamer that attracts an audience farther right than Canada's usual conservatives. King's made headlines for drumming up fear and then following through with his supporters with violence at rallies put on by BLM and Antifa. Now what it is, is it's the part of the depopulation. And a lot of people don't understand what that means and what there is, is there's an end game. It's called depopulation of the Caucasian race or the Anglo-Saxon. And that's what the goal is, is to depopulate the Anglo-Saxon race because they are the ones with the strongest bloodlines. What we're going to do is not only infiltrate by flooding with refugees, we're going to infiltrate the education systems to manipulate it to endorse this kind of behavior. This kind of behavior then endorses less procreation. All right, so the less procreation, the less white people or, you know, Anglo-Saxon, let's say. Oops, oops, uh-oh, said the quiet part out loud. Ah, oh, well, probably nothing. Anglo-Saxon, because when I say white, all, all the Antifa guys call up the... <laughs> Yeah, it's weird when I use that term instead of the, the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon bloodlines. I mean, let's go with the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon bloodlines. That one's going to be better. Anyways, to everyone who's saying that the whole thing has been astroturfed by the far right, those are the four key organizers. They are the ones who threw it. This wasn't like the, the, like the alt-right came over and astroturfed the convoy. These are the people who set the whole thing up. 
who organized it. Now, they've tried to distance themselves since from Pat King because Pat King is one of the people who's just consistently uh, going on live streams and saying things that make, you know, even the, the most stalwart conservative or Republican go like, oh, yikes, can't say that one out loud. We can think that, but we, we save that for dinner time. We don't, we don't actually say, that. okay, well, he's just live streaming right now. Okay, oh, there's 500 people watching. Well, that's not great. Um, so... The, the, those are the people who organized it. Now, since it's been organized, are there thousands of people who flooded to it because they were inspired by this entire idea of, hey, we're going to take this country back from the evil mandates that have been imposed to us by the Trudeau uh, government? Yes. And are all those people members of this organization or the Yellow Vest Movements or the Wexit Party or Canada Unity or any of that? No, they are not. But these are the people who originally started and founded it. And this has been going on for a long time. It didn't just start in the last month. It wasn't like a month ago. They're like, you know what? We have an idea. Let's take our country back through freedom and do a trucker rally it was years ago they did the unite we roll rally and then they've adopted a lot of tactics and they've done and i'll say it cleverly tapped into something in this country and globally and they've seen what excitement came in the last election in the last canadian election the ppc had any like they didn't win any seats but they got a massive growth of people because they were the ones who were messaging to everyone hey we're against mandates we're against lockdowns we're against masks we're against all that shit that you hate and people are really galvanized about that like the idea that this is like you know a pressure and they are feeling the raw oppression they've never felt before they have to do something about this and take back their lives and take back freedom that has been getting a lot of people angry and again that's not just canada it's you see the same thing in the u.s you see the same thing happening in, in like like brazil has a very similar and uh you know we, we learned this from multipolarista and benjamin norton of all people who uh you know ex uh, gray zone guy who's now uh you know doing articles about this but they're not the only ones who reported on this if you want to look into the trucker rallies in brazil very similar thing in which you have a lot of wealthy uh business class business owners who are investing heavily into promoting these things that will get people and in the case of brazil uh help prop up bolsonaro and help and help prop up bolsonaro's agenda and do the whole thing under the guise of being about workers the astroturfed aspect of all this is making people believe that this is actually a worker strike when you should be very very like uh vocal about the fact that they are not actually asking for anything that directly impacts workers unless you want to make the argument that well mandates do so so that's it that it mandates alone what do you think is going to help a truckers live more is it going to be like getting rid of a vaccine mandate at the border of which already 90 percent of truckers already complied with or is it going to be things like wage theft long overtime hours being contract workers all these kind of things but None of that has been brought up because, again, it's not really representational of truckers because it wasn't founded by truckers. The four key organizing members, none of them are truckers. None of them. But, the uh, you know, this whole thing has been taken over. And that's the reason why the right uh, in, in America love this shit. That's the reason why Tucker Carlson is reporting on this all the time. That's the reason why you've got Ted Cruz is in county, he's Canadian. But the reason you've got Ron DeSantis coming out. You've got Trump coming out. Trump fucking loves it. He's even making uh, speeches about it. Talking, oh, we support those truckers. Ah, oh, the best, the best truckers in Canada. Oh, I love those truckers. Love them. And then it's allowed everyone else who wants to kind of get fooled into this to thinking that this is like, yeah, your hinkles, your infrareds, people who actually think like this whole thing is a workers' revolt. This is a workers' revolt. And that's also fooled people who might not otherwise be convinced about this, who are now looking at this as like, well, their their tactics are working, aren't they? They're shutting down the Canadian economy. Uh, that that That's directly in opposition to uh, the interests of the capital class. So so that's good. That, that Like this. This is this is again a workers revolt that's doing that and and, and we should celebrate them because uh, again, again they're workers when there is a workers revolt either a general strike or even like a regular strike that is going to be to get more rights for the workers they are not fighting for that and the things they are fighting for happen to be things that align with the current systems of power in canada up until the point where they started blocking the borders and now once that's happened we've seen the next phase which is the uh, the trudeau government finally saying hey we're now going to have to clamp down and enact uh, the emergency services act pat king this morning pleading to the cops to support the occupation implies heavily that once pat king and the crew take control the police won't be safe from the consequences I'm speaking to each and every one of you right now in the uniform. Back off. Stand down. Put your badge on the ground. Turn it in. And stand with the people. Let's go. We have been asking for, for a long time now for our men and women of our police forces to do the right thing. Now is the time for you to do the right thing. <coughs> Oh, thanks, we Lucas Gordo. Welcome. That you're just following orders. But when this comes to an end, 
just following orders is not going to be a good legal defense. Just from, following orders from the new government is not going create? to be your saving grace while you're standing on the other side of that that witness box. <laughs> I'm speaking to each and every. I mean, that's Pat King choosing his words carefully, as you can tell. He's normally he just like he he kind of just goes off cuff. He doesn't he doesn't really prepare. It's not like I, I have a prepared statement that I've had my lawyers read over that I'm going to read. But still, he is still kind of choosing his words carefully when he speaks here, right? As best to, or as little as he can. Um, I also noticed this yesterday. This one popped up. Jordan B. Peterson, I'm a dictator who's the owner operator of his own rig and. I just introduced you all to this individual. This this is the guy who's talking about how the threat of Islam coming to uh, Canada uh, and that we have to stop them because apparently it's going to be similar to an infection of syphilis. Yeah, that that dude, the one that I showed you speaking at the People's Party rally, talking about how uh, you know Muslims have infected third world countries and their extremism is a, a, a clear and present danger. Well, I don't think a lot of that has been exposed. Maybe because a lot of people like. I, I do not foresee Jordan Peterson platforming Pat King. Every, everyone knows Pat, Pat King is toxic. Just stay 10 feet away from that guy. He's, there's a lot of video footage where he's talking about how the trans agenda, the gay agenda are, are trying to help us depopulate. You know, of course, they're trying to remove the Anglo-Saxon bud line. So we know he's bad. But BJ, he's good. He's good. He's uh, he's one of the co-founders of the GoFundMe. Uh, he doesn't have uh, nearly as much dirt. He he's an ex, uh, you know, wannabe candidate for both the Conservative Party of Canada and the the PPC. So clearly, it's okay platforming him, right? But that should be called out as well, especially like he's popping up all over Tucker Carlson's show. That one doesn't surprise me, Tucker Carlson being Tucker Carlson. But again, I, I think it might have to do with either that uh, Jordan Peterson uh, wants to enable this kind of shit or he just doesn't know and or care. Now, all that being said, once the borders uh, are effectively uh, you know, shut down for that long period of time, 18 days, uh, the, the Coots border has now been opened up. But yes, the threats to Canadian business eventually got to the point where Justin Trudeau is now invoking uh, the Emergency Measures Act. Now, there are some things that you should be worried about, uh, if you are a leftist, about the Emergency Measures Act and about just giving uh, you know, government uh, increases in power. Now, people who are saying... Uh, that this is similar to the Patriot Act, uh, that is not true. The Emergency Measures Act, it only lasts for a period of 30 days. Also, within those 30 days, Parliament is able to dissolve it at any time if they vote on dissolving it. So there is some oversight to this. That This is what I consider the good about it. Only lasts 30 days. It must be renewed by a parliamentary decision after 30 days, so the Parliament has to then vote on extending it. It can be uh, shortened, by the way. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, mandatory 30 days. It could be for a period of seven days or something like that. But it can also be dissolved at any time by Parliament. So there is some checks and balances to it. The bad and kind of the scarier things, it does authorize the RCMP to enforce municipal and provincial laws in places where they do not have contract. Law enforcement throughout Domin uh, Dominion is federalized. All crowdfunding sites now must report large, that amount has not yet been specified to what they dictate to be large, donations to FinTract. I'll explain FinTract in a second. Banks, insurance companies, credit unions, trust and loan companies, payment processors and online fundraising platforms must determine on a continuing basis if they are in possession of property tied to individuals or entities involved in legal assemblies so that puts the burden on a lot of uh different organizations whether they be banks uh, as well as the power by the way i shouldn't be uh mincing my words here but uh, on banks insurance companies credit unions trust funds uh loan companies payment processors online fundraising platforms now have to be able to identify on a continuing basis whether or not they believe that the individuals uh involved in their organization uh or receiving funding from could be involved in illegal activity and they have to report that immediately should they believe that to be the case now uh, I know a lot of people are, are thinking, well, yes, when this uh, is over, though, uh, that goes away. The problem is they want to make some of these things permanent. That's where I get into the ugly. It expands the powers of FinTrack, which is the federally, uh, the federal financial surveillance body, without parliamentary debate. And that is a permanent thing. There should be parliamentary debate of something of that severity, in my opinion. Financial institutions can now freeze accounts or assets deemed to be related to illegal activity without a court order. Now... A lot of people jumped on that one uh, and only put the headlines. I don't think they read past the headlines, but it, it, they put that like picture of Trudeau saying that like you know blah 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 this is going to happen. There is still uh, something very very dangerous about that as a precedent that it sets. And I know a lot of people are like, well, yes, but it's directly to uh, go after terrorism. Um, yes, but you could also have a conservative government come into power in two or three years, uh, and all of a sudden, like Jason Kenney already does this. Jason Kenney, the premier of Alberta, already started a tax a task force to be able to determine whether. 
or not there were environmental groups that were receiving funding from outside sources. He did this without uh, the Emergency Measures Act, by the way. Jason, Jason Kenney just did this on his own accord. So, yes, this is already done in, in uh, provincial capacity to go after lefty shit. It is done, and it can be used to go after lefty shit. It turned out Jason Kinney's investigation showed that not only did no money come in from foreign sources to fund environmental groups in Canada, but that, in fact, quite the opposite. A lot of uh, foreign money was coming in to fund uh, pro-pipeline uh, investment projects and, and uh, advocacy and stuff like that, which was kind of funny that the whole thing was kind of a reverse UNO card in that. Also, financial service providers cannot face uh, civil legal actions for complying with the order. Um so if they break, uh, say, someone's privacy by uh, saying that we thought this was an illegal activity, we then reveal uh, the funding and sources uh, to this and or their bank account was uh, frozen in the process, uh, they don't uh, face recourse for that. So these these are scary things, especially the fact that some of them are going to be implemented permanently. That is the parts of this that I would push back against and things that I would stand up against. The Canadian Civil Liberties uh, Society, which is something... Uh, uh, which is an organization that obviously that you get what you uh, pay for on the tin here, uh, released a statement today saying the federal government has not met the threshold necessary to invoke the Emergencies Act. This law creates high and clear standards for good reason. The act allows government to bypass ordinary democratic processes. The standard has not been met. The Emergencies Act can only be invoked according to its own terms when a situation seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians and is of such proportion or nature that exceeds the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it or seriously threatens the ability of the government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security, and territorial integrity of Canada, and when the situation cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law in Canada. The Emergencies Act is here to address these kinds of extreme threats to Canada, not protect the economy. Governments regularly deal with difficult situations and doing so using powers granted to them by democratically elected representatives. Emergency legislation legislation should not be normalized. It threatens our democracy and our civil liberties. Now, my pushback to some parts of this is that there are imp uh, there are parts that I've just shown you earlier uh, that have already shown themselves to be quite dangerous. Uh, specifically, the fact that they have found and charged 11 individuals, several of whom uh, with a uh, conspiracy to commit murder against RCMP officers with a large weapons uh, uh, supply. And there's a bunch of other uh, illegal activity being done. I think the point here being is that these are things that should have been handled by uh, the provincial government's police forces uh, and wasn't. And it has been uh, a complete and utter disaster in that regard. And, and a lot of people are very curious. Uh, again, in the case of like Winnipeg specifically, if you've got 26.8% of your city's budget going towards the police and during a time when you needed the police to be able to keep businesses safe, to be able to keep individuals safe, the only thing they ended up doing was arresting an indigenous counter protester. Well, that really goes to show you then maybe an argument should be putting forth, not just that we need the emergency services, or sorry, measures act immediately now in order to stop this problem that we have, but also should we not look at, and I'm going to use the term reform instead of defund here, should we not look at reforming the Winnipeg police force and reappropriating some of that vast amount of money they're getting into programs that would actually help and protect the people? Because it kind of seems like they're not doing that here and they're not really helping the people here. Should be, should be, uh, should be something that is brought up. Anyways, that's my deep dive into that. One uh, quick thing I want to mention, because no one else talked about it all over, because this is just getting drowned in the news. Saskatchewan First Nations say uh, they found 54 graves uh, at two former residential schools. Uh, that occurred yesterday. The death of children in government-run residential schools is a real breach of human rights. Wearing a mask and getting a vaccine to protect yourself and the community is not. Prayers to the community. Uh, very good tweet by Cindy Blackstock. And then finally, I wanted to see what our good old friend Jeremy had to say about all this. I'm not seeing it, but you would think based on, you know, everybody's reaction, you know, in the government that, you know, Canada's on fire. <laughs> Trudeau informed his cabinet on can of, and can a Canada's premiers of his intent Monday morning. The prime minister announced mar announcement marks the first time the act, which replaced the war measures act in 1988 had been employed. After discussing with cabinet and caucus, Trudeau announced in a press conference, I want to be clear, the scope of these measures will be time limited, geographically targeted, as well as a reasonable and proportionate money, or if they're like legitimately considering, you know, military action against these people. Uh, they're not. But um, you're saying I should put it on faster? I kind of just wanted, like, we never have Jeremy au naturel. I always put Jeremy on like 175 because he, he talks very slowly people um th there's that saying that you know if you give the government unprecedented power um during you're not giving the government unprecedented power uh 
don't know, emergencies or something like that, whatever it is, they will create emergencies to get unprecedented power. So that's not, that's a bad By what I mean by that is, yes, this is the first time this has ever been invoked. However, uh, the War Measures Act has been invoked before, which gives you much more power than this one does. This is something that replaced the War Measures Act in 1988, like he was saying earlier. Bad rendition, but I think you know what I mean. We are not using the Emergencies Act to call in the military. Yet. We are not suspending <laughs> fundamental rights or overriding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Yet. Yet. We are not limiting people's freedom of speech. Yes, you are. Yeah. We're not limiting... <laughs> kind of zero this one's going. The Emergency Act defines an emergency as a situation where it seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians, and that is such proportions or nature as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it. Meaning, you know, it's such a... Is Brie Larson involved? Yes. That's actually the only reason that Jeremy's talking about that. Brie Larson uh, crossed over into Canada and has now effectively uh, been living in Canada. So this became uh, of the utmost importance to Jeremy. Uh, it was immediate. Like, you could hear him uh, talk about this. He was like, I haven't really done anything on, on this channel for a long time. But then, you know, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. They can't enforce their rules in the United States. So if I mean, if you live, I, I don't. I'm not stepping on any, you know, laws here <laughs> from other countries. But like, if you live in Michigan or something like that, and you know some of those truckers are coming over, and you have local access to be able just just letting them know that you support them, right? Yeah. If they're around there, like in, the, in in your area, go do that. That's at the very least. That's going to be like I would love to see. I would love know? to see a freedom trucker convoy here in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to see that here in the United States, especially if it's as peaceful uh, as it was in Canada. I know. And I would also love to see Canadians seek asylum. I mean, for crying out loud, if people can do it in a caravan from Honduras, why can't Canadians right now? Can they, seriously, can they come to Michigan? Can they go to Michigan and claim asylum? Because they're actually, if... Oppressive government. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Asylum, you do not seek asylum just because your country is right. not as good as the United States. Yeah. That's not asylum. But when the government is freezing your bank accounts and threatening to jail you for speaking out against the government, or my God, jailing pastors for still preaching when the government tried to shut them down. I can't think of a more clear-cut example of a people claiming asylum. If the United States wants to actually care about... You know what's probably going to happen next? Uh, you know, we're probably going to get a bunch of politicians asking for a wall. Yeah, a wall to Canada. You know, that, that wall to U.S., uh, sorry, to Mexico kind of fizzled out, so now you're going to have a wall to Canada. And, I mean, if you're willing to build it in America, I'm sure, I'm sure Canadians probably... Probably won't contest it too much. They'll be like, "Oh, if you want to build a wall, eh? Well, yeah, you, you go about your business then, eh? Well, we'll just we'll just stare at the wall and then uh, go about ours over here. Uh, that's basically what we're trying to do here." Immigrants claiming asylum, it would at no point in our life would that asylum rule because it also has to be the nearest country. Yes. At no point in our life would it be more appropriate than Canadians right now fleeing Canada to the United States. We would have to grant them asylum. Hmm. How about that? Can there be a movement to grant Canadians asylum? Hmm. When you definitely understand how asylum seekers uh, work. Well, that's good to know. Uh, that's basically it. Uh, I suppose I should do uh, the last thing that is important. 18 naked cowboys in the showers at Ram Ranch. Big heart throbbing cocks wanting to be sucked. 18 naked cowboys. Oh, apparently the Ram Ranch broke Pat King's brain. He made some like big tweet on Telegram or something that was like, uh, "Don't uh, don't know who these trolls are. Don't believe them. There's no such thing as the Ram Ranch. Uh, it does not exist. Uh, do not uh, like listen to people telling you to go to the Ram Ranch uh, where you're going to be like greeted by 18 cowboys or anything like that. It's not a real thing. Please do not listen to them." So yeah, this is a this is an odd time uh, to be a lefty and 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 talking about this kind of stuff because we're seeing two things happening simultaneously. We're seeing something that was uh, originating from far-right origins and is getting a lot of money from uh, U.S. backers that has a lot of capital interest coming in from U.S. backers uh, that is not being treated uh, fairly by the police in this country because a lot of the police actually align themselves uh, politically with the demands of the convoy. Uh, and at the same time, we've got the Trudeau government now looking to expand governmental powers, which if they were simply being put into a series, like if they hadn't added the parts where we're like, we're permanently going to change the way that all... Um, uh, crowdfunding sites have to report to the government for sums, like things like that are very, very frightening. So that has to be talked about as well. It's one of those things where like everyone wants you to just take a side. They want you to be like, well, where do you stand on blank? Where do you stand on this? Where do you stand on that? How can you support the truckers, but also support 
workers, but you don't support the truckers, but you also support people's right to protest, and you're for a general strike, and you'd like to see one, and and you, you talked about how indigenous groups have done similar tactics, but at the same time, you think this whole thing is kind of an asterisk, but, uh, but you, you're also against this part of the, like, I, I, I don't even think nuance is, is the word anymore, it's just like, there's, there's a lot of things going on, there's, there's a lot of things going on, but we can, we can learn to walk and chew gum, I think, at the same time. I, you know, I mean, they, they, they learn how to do it at the Ram Ranch. Hot, hard, buff cowboys, their cocks throbbing hard. Uh, Nazis have been trendy for a while. The yard. Pat King they and Nazis are trendy. Cocks ever so hard. Gonna roll Orgy the dice the here. Showers at oh. Ram Ranch. Did you Big see that? Throbbing cocks, ramming. Okay, that just happened, right? I, I, I moved the cursor over Pat King's name and it turned to Nazis. Did that like do, do my eyes besiege me? All right, besiege me. Uh, hold on, I gotta I gotta check the clips. It totally happened. Does that happen a lot? Ever so hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's that's a little random internet glitch. So so there you go. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, internet. Thanks, Jack Dorsey. Do you enjoy the surfs but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form, available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free, just like the podcast. To our gods, Xander Corvus and Peyton L. Just, we beseech thee to smite down our enemies. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble court jesters here to amuse you. To our lords, Trevor R., we give thanks for this spit of land for us to eke out this meager existence. To our knights, Merid, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruby Kelly, Ellie Leslie, Alex P., Brandon, Words Greenwood, Nate, That One Guy, Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Val 9000, Jenna Tall, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multi Mondi, Trevor Yanis, Lemmy 101, Anthropophojack, Seren 42, Catherine, Radical Maniac, Ramon Acosta, Nkosin, Violet Orchard, Sophie Baby, Political Puppy, Andreas Chiringuito, Zach Christensen, Josh Mickelson, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We raise our flag in a veil, and we salute you, our friends.